Let's pray together. God, you are holy. We have sung of your holiness this morning. We are reminded of the fact that you are holy and we are not. We are reminded through the communion that Jesus gave his life so that we could achieve holiness, not on our own, but through the forgiveness of sin that comes only because of his death on the cross. And Father, we're also reminded through these songs and through our readings that we are promised holiness through the gift of your Holy Spirit. Father, as we study your word today, make us aware of your Spirit's presence in our lives. But Father, not only aware of his presence, but the purpose of his presence, why you have given us your Spirit. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, when I was still working as a director of church relations for Heritage Christian University, I was invited to speak on a missions Sunday at a congregation. Now what a mission Sunday is, or at least was for this congregation, was when they would have representatives from each of the mission works that they support come in on a day and give reports as to how the mission work was doing. And being that, that Heritage Christian is a school that trains primarily gospel preachers and missionaries, we were one of their mission points. So I was asked to come and give an update on how things were going at the school. As I walked into the foyer on that cold November morning, I recall seeing, um, no it wasn't in Florida because it was cold, um, that cold November morning, I remember seeing their statistics board. Now if you don't know what that is, in, in every good southern congregation in the Bible Belt, as you walk in the foyer, Cheryl knows what I'm talking about, there's a statistics board and it will tell you, um, you know, how many were there last week, how many were there the week before, uh, what their contribution was, what their budget is, what their year-to-date contribution is, and baptisms to date. And, and it struck me that this church that was celebrating the missions that they had supported had zero baptisms to that point. As I was introduced, the one introducing me began talking about what a difference the school that I worked with was making in the church in America. And then all of a sudden, his, his introduction of me shifted <laughs> to, to what I... I can't think of any other words for it except a, a patriotic tirade that had nothing to do with me, the school I represented, or the gospel. He began talking about how Christians needed to take America back. And as I heard him say that, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness because it seemed as if, at least in his mind, God's kingdom and the kingdom of America were somehow one and the same. Now, before we're too hard on what I believe was a well-meaning brother in Christ, let us recall that the apostles made the same mistake that he did. After three years of teaching on what the kingdom was, the apostles still had an earthly kingdom in their minds and on their hearts. And what America is to some of us, Israel was to them, and they wanted to take Israel back. That's what we read in our text this morning. However, our Savior had other things in mind. In church, he still has other things in mind. His desire for the church is to be a spiritual kingdom that transcends culture, politics, 
or even geographic location. He told the apostles before his ascension that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, but also in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. No longer was the kingdom about a single geographic location, but about the power of the Holy Spirit to lead where he sees fit. Now that is where many of us tend to get a little bit nervous. When we talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? What does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? We saw last week, for just hours before his death on the cross, Jesus sat down with his apostles and he prepared them for what was getting ready to happen. He prepared them for the fact that soon he was not going to be with them physically. Not only did he spend some time praying over them and encouraging them and washing their feet and encouraging them to do the same for one another, he also made it clear that he was not going to leave them alone. That he was going to give them the Holy Spirit to be their constant companion. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would guide the church into all truth and would provide direction for the work that Jesus wanted done. So the book of Acts begins with Jesus telling the disciples, in essence, wait for the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything yet. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. When he does, you'll know it. <laughs> And there will be work for you to do. And that work is to tell the whole world about me. Reading the text again, beginning in verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Which, he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Another one of those times I envisioned Jesus going, face palm. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fi fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. The rest of the book of Acts from this point forward is telling what happened when these men allowed the Holy Spirit to lead them. They were changed from a group of intimidated fishermen and, and, and former tax collectors and zealots to a force that literally turned the world upside down. The Holy Spirit led them to speak to Jesus, to speak about Jesus to everyone they came in contact with. They preached in synagogues. They even spoke to people in the marketplace and they told everyone they came in contact with that there was good news. That Jesus had overcome death, and they could too if they would place their faith in him. The direction that Jesus gave them is pretty clear. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The purpose of the church is to be his witnesses. Period. To tell others about the things we know to be true about Jesus. It is our mission. And when we say church, it doesn't mean preacher and, and, and people with titles. It means us, all of us, you, not the person next to you, you. It is our mission here on earth to tell people about Jesus. Now, I know that when preachers make statements like that, we tend to start thinking of mental excuses 
for not being witnesses. Either we say, well, I, I, I just don't know enough. Or, oh, but I'm just so shy. Or, well, you know, people are entitled to their beliefs. And I don't want to infringe on other people's private beliefs. You know, there are all kinds of reasons and excuses not to tell. But Jesus didn't say, be my witnesses, unless you're shy. And then you're off the hook. He didn't say, be my witnesses, unless you don't know enough. And then you're good. You're all right. Be my witnesses, unless you're an introvert. You can't help that. That's, that's you know, my father made you that way. And if... He didn't say any of that. Matter of fact, being an extrovert, according to Rebecca uh, Manley Pippert, this is a great quote, being an extrovert isn't essential to evangelism. Obedience and love are. And I wish I wrote that. Being an, intro, being an extrovert isn't essential to evangelism. Obedience and love are. You know why? Because the power is not in you. It's not in you. You know, I'm going to tell you something, and this isn't in my notes, but some of y'all have figured out something about me in the last year I've been here. I'm an introvert trying to be an extrovert. I am not the most warm and fuzzy person you're ever going to meet. And I know that. Don't say amen. <laughs> I already know it. Don't need witnesses. Every Sunday I get up here, I struggle with it. I sit in my office and I pray. And I fret over it. But it's taken me a long time to figure out that this isn't about me. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and you being witnesses has nothing to do with you. Well, I just, I just, I just, I, 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 and we I ourselves right out of obedience to Christ. You see, Jesus has not told us to do something that he hasn't given us every tool to accomplish. Right in the middle of his direction to be witnesses is a promise to give us the resources to do the job. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You see, the church does not become unstoppable when we get it all together. Lord knows that's not it. Because if that's it, we're never going to get it all together. Amen. We're not perfect people. We'd have no chance. The church becomes unstoppable not when we have perfect programs, perfect ministries, or perfect people. It becomes unstoppable when, when God's power is allowed to accomplish his will. If we make ourselves available to him, if we make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit, he will use us to do incredible things. Do you believe that? Three of you. Do you believe that? Because it's not me that said it. But for us to do that, here's the hard part. We have to put our own personal agendas aside. And let God set the agenda for the future of our lives and the future of his church. His agenda, according to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, is making known his manifold wisdom. That's his agenda for the church. That's his purpose for the church. And it's singular, that's it. And in regards to this agenda, he promises that we will be able to accomplish immeasurably more than all we can even ask or imagine according to the power that is the Holy Spirit who is at work within us. Do you hear that promise? Unlimited resources. Our God has unlimited resources. And I don't think there's a person here who would argue that truth. But those resources are available to us through his Holy Spirit in accordance with his will. 
Now, if that's the case, if God has given us power to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, why is it that we don't? Why is it that we often fail to see God do immeasurably more in our lives and in our churches? Why are our baptistries underused? Why are new Christians classes a thing of the past? I'm afraid if we're being honest, we know why. We don't experience the power of God in our lives because we're afraid of where the Holy Spirit might lead us. We know that at the heart of the call of Christ is to give up our own personal agendas, our very lives, for the sake of his glory. And let's just be painfully honest here. Many of us want the blessings of Christ's lordship. We want eternal life in heaven, and we want abundant life on earth. But if we're being honest, we have more interest in receiving God's stuff than carrying out his will. And I'm not trying to be negative right now either. I'm not. I'm excited about what God is doing at Mandarin. I am. Good things are happening here. We're growing. Wounds are being healed. But we need to be careful that we aren't doing it on our own power, with our own agendas, and here for our own reasons. The church exists for God's purposes and nobody else's. And furthermore, I know that many churches aren't growing. Statistical data shows that 9 out of 10 churches are either declining or growing at a slower pace than their communities. The 2016 edition of Churches of Christ in the United States showed that church membership had declined from 1,245,540, this is Church of Christ, Membership had declined from 1,245,540 in 1980 to 1,149,799 in 2016. Now that may not look too bad until we realize that the U.S. population has increased from 226.5 million to 321.4 million. So while the U.S. population is up 34.6%, Church of Christ population is down 7.9%. And again, I'm not trying to be negative. And I'm not trying to depress you. I'm trying to encourage you that there is hope. And this might surprise you, but that hope is found in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Listen to verses 9 through 11 of Acts chapter 1. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus has been taken up from you into heaven. He will come in just the same way you have watched him go into heaven. This is almost a humorous scene. The disciples are standing around as Jesus ascends into heaven, almost straining their eyes to just catch every last glimpse of him they can. They just want to see him. As he ascends. And then two men in white robes, probably angels, ask them a question. What are you looking at? <laughs> what are you looking at? Jesus is gone. But that's not the end of the story. He is coming back. See, behind that final statement is one of the most important understandings that all Christians need to understand. 
God is in charge of history. History is his story. And he determined when it began, and he will determine when it ends. God is in charge of history. And that's not an assumed way of thinking in our world, is it? There are all sorts of ways of thinking about history. There's the cyclical view of history. This is often referred to as karma. The oriental philosophy of what goes around comes around. There's the evolutionary view of history that, that believes that time goes back into nothingness, continues into nothingness. And there's progress, but this progress is determined by natural selection and chance. And when it's over, it's over with. Decreasing in popularity is the biblical view of history. That is, God brought earth into being. He revealed himself to Israel. He sent his son to redeem the earth from the consequences of sin. He established his church. And someday, he will call history to an end. And he will call his followers home to be with him for an eternity. At the heart of the biblical view of history is the belief that there is a being who created us and to whom we are accountable. If the cyclical or evolutionary view of the world is true, then this is all there is, and you better get all you can while you can. But if the biblical, true, biblical view of history is true, then there's hope beyond this life. There is a God who creates and a God who calls people to account for their actions. For thousands of years, people have debated these views of history and have chosen to live their lives according to one of these philosophies. And if you're in this building this morning, most likely you have chosen to trust in the biblical view of history. You believe that God is ultimately in control of history, right? This is yes, this is no. You believe that God is in control of history. Okay, now listen. If that's true, if our unstoppable God is in control of history, His church has the power to be unstoppable because we are His we're his. And if it's his story, then we have the power to be whatever he wants us to be. Jesus said in Matthew 16 that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Now, we often think of the church as being on defense, right? We're defending ourselves from false teaching, from immorality, from godless politics, from sin, from Satan. But we've got it all wrong. Gates are a defensive mechanism. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Gates are defensive. You know, if, if, if you're watching a football game and, and the... The, the, you know, you're, you're, you're watching and you've got the defensive line there. You want the offensive line to prevail against the defensive line. That's the way it works. And if you're a Florida State fan, Tom, Andrew, it doesn't work, does it? Whew. Had to turn away from that yesterday. But there's a difference between offense and defense, right? Back, back to yes and no. There's a difference between offense and defense. Gates are defensive. What does that mean? What does that mean? We're on offense. The church is on offense. That means that the church lives in the firm hope that we have the power and the direction to bang down the doors of hell and rescue those who Satan has ensnared. We're not afraid of hell. We're not afraid of Satan. Because as big as his defensive line is, God's offensive line is bigger. 
And you know what God's offensive line is? You. His church. Paul put it this way. And I love this verse. In 2 Corinthians 10.4. We have the power to demolish strongholds. Does sin have a stronghold on this world? Does godless politics have a stronghold on this world? Does immorality have a stronghold on this world? Does greed have a stronghold on this world? We have the power to demolish those strongholds. And that power is the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended into heaven, it was with the promise that he would not leave us on our own. And he is still with us today through his Holy Spirit. He will come again in bodily form to claim those who are his followers. But until then, he leaves every one of us with a choice. He leaves his church with a choice. Will we plug into his power and fulfill our purpose? Or? Will we focus on our own agendas, our own wants, our own desires, and be stoppable? Let's go back to where we started. In one sense, I agree with my introducer who said Christians need to take America back, in one sense. But in another sense, I realized that America was never ours to begin with. I think that maybe what he was trying to say, I hope, is that the church needs to get busy sharing the message of Jesus with our nation. Now, with that statement, I agree with two caveats. One, we need to share it with individuals. And two, it doesn't matter what nation they belong to. To the ends of the earth. If we want to become unstoppable, we can't put limits on what God has called us to do. Jesus' words to the ends of the earth calls the modern church to drop our political agendas, to drop our internal distractions, to drop our social club mentalities, and allow the Holy Spirit to use us to be his witnesses. Let's pray. Father, our prayer this morning is simple. Our prayer is that we will all allow your Holy Spirit to use us. Father, for each person here who has been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we know, Father, that you have added them to your church, and we know, Father, that you have given them the gift of your Holy Spirit. But, Father, we also know that there are times we need to be encouraged to be filled with the Spirit. There are times we need to be encouraged not to grieve the Spirit. There are times that we need to be encouraged to walk in the Spirit. And we pray, Father, that as we leave this place today, that we will walk in the Spirit and that we will be empowered. Empowered, Father, to answer your call and be your witnesses. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mother Teresa once said, No one thinks of the pen while reading the letter. They only want to know the mind of the person who wrote the letter. That's exactly what I am in God's hand. A little pencil. As we sing the invitation song this morning, I just want to ask you, are you allowing yourself to be a pencil in the hand of God? Is his agenda your agenda? Are you doing what he wants you to do? Are you completely 100% sold out to the leading of the Holy Spirit? If not, we want to pray for you this morning.
We, we, we want to lift you up to God. We want to help you in your journey in any way that we can. Maybe you've never been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the reception of that Holy Spirit gift. We'd love to help you with that this morning as well. If we can be of any assistance to you at all, won't you come? Always stand and sing.